with Phantom Liberty dropping this week and a whole bunch of marketing coming from Nvidia saying how good DLSS 3.5 is, I wanted to answer the question, is frame generation worth the extra money? Hey guys, Turk here. I hope you're having a good one. I know DLSS 3 has been around for quite a while at this point, but I've only just recently gotten my hands on an RTX 4000 series GPU. For the uninitiated, DLSS stands for Deep Learning Super Sampling. This technology uses a neural network to upscale a rendered frame to a larger resolution. For example, DLSS can take a rendered 1080p frame and run it through their algorithm to make it a 1440p or even 4K frame in real time. By reducing the render resolution to 1080p, the GPU doesn't need to work as hard to generate that 4K output frame. In theory, upscaling decreases the total render time and in turn increases the game's frame rate in terms of performance. DLSS itself has been around since about February of 2019 and over the years, the algorithm has matured and continues to improve its visual accuracy along the way. With DLSS 3, Nvidia passes that rendered frame through an optical flow frame generation technique to generate additional frames. These generated frames are then inserted back into the frame buffer, thus artificially increasing the output frame rate. At first, the use of fake frames was frowned upon by gamers, but over the past year, additional improvements, model training, and better implementation in games have warmed up the masses to its use. Coupled with Nvidia's reflex latency technology, this frame insertion is nearly imperceivable to the untrained eye. Though it's still in its early stages, this technology continues improving, and more games are including it in their render pipeline. Frame generation sounds great and all, but there is a catch. It only works with Nvidia's latest RTX 4000 series of GPUs. Nvidia's Ada Lovelace GPUs have an optical flow accelerator built into the GPU, improving the technique's performance and its accuracy. By including this hardware, the RTX 4000 series is primed for better performance, which has some lucrative upsides for the industry. Since the GPUs can render frames faster through upscaling and can create frames through frame generation, developers can use some of that extra free time to incorporate additional graphical effects into their pipeline, namely ray tracing. As I mentioned in my Why Ray Tracing Sucks video, Ray tracing takes a lot of time to render and it drops performance considerably across the board. By using frame generation and lower and more accurate resolution upscaling, even the slowest GPUs, such as an RTX 4060 Ti, can harness ray tracing in impressive ways. But with that class of GPU, the question still stands. Is frame generation really worth the added price tag with the RTX 4000 series? This comparison, it's a little bit different from your standard GPU or technology review. Rather than segment the feature off and compare it in a vacuum, I wanted to compare DLSS 3 against what's already on the market. For most gamers, if a game already provides upscaling technology, you better believe we're gonna use it. So I wanted to test each GPU today with native, upscaled, and compare that to frame generation. That does unfortunately limit my comparison to just games that I have that incorporate DLSS 3, but with eight games, I think it's a good start. I'll be testing at roughly console equivalent quality settings at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K resolutions. Now let's talk GPUs. Nvidia was kind enough to send me an RTX 4060 Ti for testing. I met up with the Freeman back at QuakeCon in August, and he was very interested in my DLSS versus FSR comparison. Beyond the GPU, there's been no exchange of funds or even requirements for my games or my settings that I'm testing. This is as unbiased of a configuration that I could come up with. Though the 4060 Ti is a decent GPU, the GPU market right now is incredibly tough, and at the $400 price point, there are plenty of good GPUs to be had. From NVIDIA, you can get a brand new RTX 3070 from Newegg for about 400 bucks. If you want ultimate value, the RTX 3080 can be found on eBay for about 405 bucks. On AMD's side, I'm pitting it against my current favorite GPU, the RX 6700 XT. On Newegg, they're on sale for about 340 bucks brand new, which is a great bargain, as you'll see later in this video. 
Of course, if you want to go with a used AMD GPU, the RX 6800 XT is a bit more expensive, coming in around 415 bucks. I know the 6800 and the latest 7700 XT would fit well in this comparison, I just don't have access to either of those cards today. That's a whole lot of data points, guys, so I've got some timestamps down below to help you get the information that you want to see. We've got a lot of data to comb through, so let's get cracking. Across the eight games I've tested, a lot of them behave as one would expect from the technology and the 4060 Ti. Let's start with Returnal. The RTX 4060 Ti is relatively similar to the 3070 and the 6700 XT in terms of upscaling from the native resolution. Turning on frame generation instantly bumps us past the RTX 3080, but still behind the 6800 XT. As for 1% lows, frame gen instantly smooths out my 120Hz monitor. Forza Horizon 5 doesn't scale all that well, but we see modest improvements across the board from upscaling. The 4060 Ti is comparable to the 3070, and it lands anywhere between the 6700 and 6800 XT. However, frame gen takes performance to another level. 1% lows surpass the previous high gen card's average frame rate. With Phantom Liberty dropping this week, I just haven't had a chance to retest this with the 2.0 update. But the poster child for Nvidia's tech at 1080p, you'd think the 4060 Ti is all you need. Across all the cards tested, 1% lows are comfortably above 60 FPS for native and upscaled modes. As we saw in Forza, the 4060 Ti lands somewhere between AMD's cards, but just shy of the 3070. But that DLSS3 frame gen, oh man, I had to retest this data point just to make sure. The 4060 Ti's 1% low is nearly as fast as the 3080 and 6800 XT's average frame rate. The other poster child of Nvidia tech, The Witcher 3, it's a little less dramatic than Cyberpunk, but it scales significantly better. At native resolution, the 4060 Ti scores better than the 6700 XT and a little lower than the 3070. Turning on DLSS 2 upscaling though, cranks it past the 6700 XT and is comparable to a 3080 and 6800 XT's native performance. Now, let's turn on frame gen. The scaling continues and the average FPS is on par with those high-end GPUs, but the 1% low improvement, it's a little less than other games on this list. I'm having a blast in Starfield, so I had to include Pure Dark's DLSS 3 mod for this video. Compared to FSR 2's native implementation, scaling is consistent between FSR and DLSS. The 4060 Ti manages to land in last place, though it is still playable. But turn on that frame gen and you'll instantly nearly double your performance for both average and 1% low frame rate. For the RTX 4060 Ti, 1080p is a sweet spot for performance improvements, but does that carry over to a more enthusiast resolution of 1440p? Back to the top of the list with Returnal. Now, the 4060 Ti at native resolution is perfectly playable. However, it just needs more horsepower compared to the other cards in the lineup. Even turning on DLSS 2 only matches the performance of our previous mid-range GPUs from 2020. Frame generation scales well with Returnal, but still, that's just not enough to beat even standard upscaling of those mid-range GPUs. Forza follows suit. The 4060 Ti is completely playable here, but it's still slower than the competition. DLSS 2 helps it compete against the 6700 XT but frame generation is required for the 4060 Ti to be competitive against the native 3070 GPU. Nvidia's flagship title, Cyberpunk, does show a ray of hope for how good frame generation can be. As with the previous two titles, native performance isn't great for the 4060 Ti, but upscaling makes it comparable to the mid-range competitors. Frame gen though, that is the secret sauce to surpass those GPUs. 1% lows are comfortably above the 60 FPS target. Compared to the 6800 XT and the 3080, frame generation nearly hits 120 Hz refresh rate. And again, those 1% lows are significantly better than both high-end GPUs. Witcher 3 shows very similar scaling to Cyberpunk, but far less optimistic. 1% lows can't squeak past 60 FPS, 
which falls short of the mid-range competition. But 1% lows are in the ballpark of the native experience of the high-end and upscaled mid-range GPUs. Starfield continues the excellent scaling for all of the GPUs tested, particularly the 4060 Ti. Upscaling alone matches the other mid-range GPUs, and turning on frame gen pits 1% lows with the average frame rate of the high-end GPUs. So at 1440p, the 4060 Ti is outclassed by older mid-range competitors, but DLSS 3 keeps it in the fight, especially in those newer titles. However, 4K zaps all of the wind out of the sails for the 4060 Ti. Granted, the card wasn't really designed for this resolution, but I expect a lot with the amount of marketing backing FrameGen. Returnal slips with FrameGen enabled, barely competing with the native experience of the 6700 XT. Forza continues to scale well, but FrameGen can't add enough performance to surpass a mid-range AMD card. The best case scenario with Cyberpunk barely puts it in competition with the 3070, though upscaling alone, it could be passable for the 4060 Ti. The story repeats itself with The Witcher 3. The 4060 Ti, even with frame gen enabled, still sees about half the performance of the high-end RTX 3080. Starfield is kind of the only positive story for frame gen here with the 4060 Ti matching the RTX 3080's upscaled performance. However, it's crucial to note that AMD's cards naturally perform better than NVIDIA cards in Starfield, at least at the time of writing. Hopefully in the coming weeks, Bethesda can improve their NVIDIA performance, and maybe we'll see some native implementations of DLSS frame gen baked into the engine. As decent as the results were for those five games, I've got three more games that just hit different. Diablo 4 has had a rocky reception from gamers, but it at least gets some love with NVIDIA's DLSS 3 support. At 1080p, resolution scaling alone gives us expected performance improvements for all GPUs tested. However, frame generation kind of fails to improve our average frame rate inside the Mercy's Reach dungeon. The saving grace is a 29% improvement in 1% low frame rates. This improvement could be considered a win, especially compared to the other high-end cards. At 1440p, we start to slip behind, similar to the other games we saw before. The 4060 Ti scales well, but just can't match the 3070's native performance. 4K is very similar, and the 4060 Ti can't spare any cycles for frame gen to kick in. Compared to the other cards in the lineup, the 4060 Ti, it just runs out of steam. Now, let's sprinkle in a little bit of ray tracing with Spider-Man Remastered. The performance RT mode on the PlayStation 5 aims for 60 FPS at 1440p. Spider-Man Remastered is a clear case of a CPU bottleneck at 1080p. My test rig today uses a 5800X3D, so upscaling alone can't improve performance, even with RT Engage swinging around Times Square. However, FrameGen has plenty of time to kick in, and it shows. 1% lows line up with high-end average frame rates, and averages comfortably cap out a 120Hz monitor. 1440p helps shift the load more to the GPU, and our mid-range GPUs scale well. However, both the 3080 and 6800 XT are still CPU limited. Frame gen pays its fair share, making the 4060 Ti competitive with other NVIDIA cards and surpassing AMD's offerings. Bumping up to 4K, frame gen scales well, but we're still comparable to AMD's native and upscaled performance. On the surface, Plague Tale performs very well for the 4060 Ti, and frame generation bumps the card past high-end status, even with 1% lows. However, Azobo Studio still needs to enable FSR into the game, so I can't fairly compare frame gen to those cards' upscaling capabilities. Though 1080p performance is excellent, 1440p slaps me in the face, and the card can barely compete with a native experience for any of the cards on display today. As we come to know and love with Plague Tale, these cards are only somewhat enjoyable at 4K, except for the mighty RTX 3080. Since Spider-Man is heavily CPU limited and Plague Tale Requiem doesn't have support for FSR, let's remove those games from the sample and look at a six game average. Remember, these numbers don't reflect any particular game's performance, but reflect the average impact upscaling and frame generation have on a card's performance. 
At 1080p, engaging DLSS 2 on the 4060 Ti bumps average performance by a modest 20%. 1% lows are also increased by about 18%. The 3070 sees similar improvement at 23%, and the 3080 by 16. FSR 2 shows similar performance improvement with quality mode to DLSS 2. The 6700 XT improves by 22%, and the 6800 XT by 15%. 1% lows are similarly improved, so overall, this sample of games is very similar to the other DLSS versus FSR comparisons I've covered here on the channel. Now frame generation. Compared to native performance, we see a massive 53% improvement. 1% lows show even better results at 67%. More importantly, those 1% lows are higher than the average frame rates for the 6700 XT and it's arguably similar to last generation high-end GPUs from NVIDIA and AMD. But reality starts to creep in at 1440p and our hype train starts to stall. General upscaling improves average frame rates between 24 and 33% for each card, with 1% lows slightly lower between 20 and 40%. Those numbers are insufficient to make the 4060 Ti comparable to other mid-range GPUs in the $400 price range. Frame generation is impressive, but less potent than at 1080p. Compared to native, frame gen boosts performance again by a whopping 65%, but even that performance improvement only makes it comparable to a 3070 or 6700 XT. As for the high end, the 3080 and 6800 XT are sitting above 120 FPS on average. And 4K, oh man. The 4060 Ti, even with frame generation, can't keep up with mid-range GPU performance. Though frame gen improves performance by a massive 66%, that improvement can't compensate for the lack of GPU horsepower for Nvidia's higher-end mainstream GPU. However, it's not all doom and gloom here. Frame generation can make a 30 FPS experience almost a fluid 60 FPS at 4K with the same settings. Oh man, that was a lot of data. All in, we're looking at about 17 hours worth of just data collection. So if you guys like what you're seeing, consider following the channel. I cover GPUs, handhelds, and all sorts of gaming tech. So hit subscribe if you appreciate the hard work. So let's circle back to the original question. Is DLSS 3 frame generation worth the extra money? Each of these GPUs is roughly around $400 US at the time of writing you can pick up either mid-range GPU brand new over at Newegg. And if you want to go into the used market, you can pick up these high-end GPUs for about 400 bucks. Let's compare dollars per frame to see how far $400 can stretch with upscaling performance. At 1080p, the stock 4060 Ti experience is less valuable than other mid-range GPUs at the $400 price point. Engaging standard upscaling bumps those cards up to stock high-end GPU value. Adding frame gen on top of that, the 4060 Ti is a better value than the high-end GPUs. From a dollar per frame perspective, frame generation provides 28% more value on top of upscaled performance. Let's pad the stats even more. Compared to native performance, that's 38% more value just by flipping a switch. At 1440p, frame gen is required to compete with last generation GPU value. Case in point, the RTX 3070. The 4060 Ti stock experience is 33% less value. Upscaling makes it more competitive, but with like-for-like -like conditions, the gap only tightens to 26%. Frame generation only achieves an equivalent value to the mid-range upscaled performance. As for the used market, that additional graphic load at 1440p clearly favors the more powerful cards. Remember, the 4060 Ti wasn't designed or marketed for 1440p in higher resolutions. However, adding upscaling technology and frame generation makes its value comparable to a stock high-end experience. Granted, the performance isn't really there, but it is available if you want to try it out. With performance and value in hand and about a week to digest the numbers, I'm a little torn about DLSS 3. I probably love technology more than your average tech tuber, but DLSS 3 and frame generation, it both impresses and disappoints me. On one hand, 
frame generation is an excellent asset for enabling the future of gaming. Let's take Starfield for example. The 4060 Ti by itself can barely provide a 30 FPS experience at 4K. But if we engage DLSS to performance mode and turn on frame generation, you're looking at a fluid 60 FPS experience in the most stressful of areas. With frame generation, the 4060 Ti can give you a taste of what a high-end GPU can offer. Also, frame generation can bypass some system bottlenecks. Spider-Man is a prime example. Though performance is CPU limited at 1080p, frame generation alone can almost double your 1% low performance and can save you money compared to a CPU or a platform upgrade. If you're running into a CPU bottleneck like in Baldur's Gate 3, frame generation is a quick workaround that other cards, they just can't provide. As games continue to release with RT effects and heavy graphical demands, frame gen will help mitigate the impact and it may even enable you to try things that you wouldn't do on a similarly priced GPU, namely ray tracing. However, DLSS 3 isn't necessary for the average gamer. In the $400 price range, many PC builders should aim for 1440p as a target resolution. Compared to the other GPUs shown today, options in that range are better than a 4060 Ti with or without frame gen enabled. Adding salt to the wound, the 4060 Ti is targeted for 1080p gaming, and without ray tracing, we are already averaging nearly 120 FPS in all the games we tested today. That also matches with Hardware Unbox's results. The 4060 Ti just doesn't need upscaling to hit 120 average frame rate. DLSS 3 looks to be a solution in search of a problem, which is a very weird place for the 4060 Ti. On this card, I would love for it to perform better at 1440p, but its 8GB VRAM buffer is a potential sore spot. The VRAM limitation is even worse. Considering the 6700 XT already has more VRAM, performs a bit weaker, and it's arguably cheaper. Remember, turning on all those RT effects will also increase your VRAM usage, and frame generation can't fix that. Despite the VRAM limitations, which could be a bit overblown, the 4060 Ti underperforms at 1440p and frame generation starts to taper off and isn't as potent as 1080p. Now, Cyberpunk with RT Overdrive is really cool. If you've been following the channel for any amount of time, I have loved path tracing with Minecraft, with Quake 2 RTX, and I just really love the effect. But for the average gamer, do you want to sacrifice 120 FPS for your 1% low for a better looking 73 FPS experience? For me, I sure would love to try it out, but I bet a bunch of gamers just wouldn't be willing to sacrifice performance. Let's also not forget software support. At the time of writing, only about 40 games support frame gen. You'll only get the added value if the game you want to play supports the feature. Nvidia is hard at work getting upcoming games like Modern Warfare 3 and Alan Wake running with DLSS 3, and they're continuing to support games like Fortnite, adding additional RTX features. And if Pure Dark's rapid implementation of DLSS 3 into Starfield is any indicator, the modding scene is a prime avenue to get frame generation shoved into your favorite game. Bottom line, I think DLSS 3 is an excellent tool on a GPU, but it shouldn't be the reason to buy that GPU. The technology shows a lot of promise, but it will always be limited by the strength of your card. Instead, I consider it the cherry on top of a solid feature foundation. DLSS upscaling is generally better than FSR, and frame generation is only starting to pick up steam. The NVENC encoder is better suited for live streaming and content creation, and I think it's quite better than AMD's encoding offerings. Overall, NVIDIA's driver support is significantly better than what AMD has delivered with their RDNA 3 GPUs. And that's all I've got to say about DLSS 3 for now. I know I had to cut a lot of games off this list for my initial analysis, so tell me down in the description what games you're looking forward to trying out with FrameGen. Now, I'm not done with DLSS 3, and I'm already working on a follow-up to my DLSS versus FSR 3, with even better comparisons, including frame generation into the mix. As always, you guys can talk to me directly over on Twitter, at the Turk, and I appreciate you guys sticking to the end of the video. I hope you've had a good one. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Later.